discussing Peyronie's disease. It affects about one out of 10 men. And it's a disorder really of wound healing of the tunica albuginea, which is this covering of collagenous connective tissue over the penis. So in Peyronie's disease, the plaque forms inside this connective tissue and it deforms the shape of the penis. And it can form plaques internally and that plaque can make erections difficult to achieve. There are some risk factors that can increase your risk of getting Peyronie's disease. The big ones are hypogonadism, which means a testosterone less than 300. Similarly, diabetes. The worse the diabetes, the worse the Peyronie's. There are a bunch of other less common conditions, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, Paget's disease, scleroderma, systemic sclerosis. All of these conditions can cause Peyronie's disease. They're not as common, uh, but they definitely can cause it. It can happen at any age, and it does affect younger men. However, it usually occurs in men over 50. Now, another question that people have is, what is it like to have Peyronie's disease? Obviously, there's a curvature of the penis. Men come in sometimes simply because the curvature of the penis makes sex with their partners uncomfortable. A classic example is a wife refusing to have intercourse with her husband because of the discomfort caused by the curvature. Sometimes, instead of a curvature, there's a ring that forms in the middle of the penis and it surrounds the penis. So it's not a plaque on one side or the other, but just a ring around the middle of the penis. There are two phases in Peyronie's disease. In the acute phase, that's the first six to sometimes up to 18 months, the penile deformity progresses. So there's scarring, scarring gets worse. Uh, there's usually some associated pain, either with an erection or even in, even in a flaccid state. And in the chronic phase, symptoms will plateau and the deformity remains stable. At that point, some people get either an improvement or actually resolution, particularly of the pain associated with the curvature. Next big topic is how is Peyronie's disease diagnosed? Physical examination is by far the most important element in the diagnosis of Peyronie's disease. You need an exam and you need an exam by a urologist. Testing includes ultrasound and labs. They're gonna be looking at circulation. They're gonna be checking for the things that I mentioned earlier, hypogonadism, low testosterone, uh, diabetes, that kind of thing. Start your workup for Peyronie's disease with your urologist because they will help you determine what exactly is going on. Treatment options for Peyronie's disease. There's two broad categories, non-invasive and invasive. There are a variety of oral and topical medications. Patients with smaller plaques, they'll come to us, to our practice, for acoustic wave therapy, which is uh, basically the sound wave therapy, similar to what you use to break up uh, kidney stones. It's not painful and can provide some very satisfactory correction of the curvature as well as uh, improvement in erectile function. Invasive options include the injections. Uh, this is with something called collagenase, which dissolves plaques or interferon or verapamil. And these are recommended by the American Urological Association. It's recommended in patients with a curvature of greater than 30 degrees, but less than 90 degrees and intact erectile function. Acoustic wave therapy is used in conjunction with uh, injections to help with the modeling. Full-on surgical options include removal of the plaques, surgically taking the plaques out, uh, or if that's not possible, even implantation of a penile prosthesis, which obviously then resolves the entire problem. Which treatment option is best for you? Less severe calcifications, which would be grade one and two, they can be treated either with acoustic therapy and modeling alone or with injections and, and acoustic therapy. Grade three calcifications, those are greater than one and a half centimeters in any diameter or multiple plaques greater than one centimeter are the ones that are most likely to need surgery. Remember, insurance doesn't always cover every procedure that works, regardless of how effective given procedure is. So you may wind up being offered a treatment that might not be covered by insurance, but may still resolve the problem for you.